Congratulations to all of you to be here at uh, 7 p.m. So I think I'll give the last talk of the day. Uh, here are my, my links of interest. We quite everybody working in ICU. And I have to talk to you about the use of volatile in the treatment of ERDS. More precise than the other speakers. So everybody, I think, is comfortable with the ERDS and the old syndrome, kind of lung edema with a lot of protein, a lot of cell, lots of damage. We can move on on a dramatic issue with fibrotic lung. And this year, ERDS are 50 years old. And I think it's time to kill ERDS. 50 years is too much for the same pathology. And if we look around the last 50 years, only few things have been done. Lots of money, a lot of studies, but only a few things. What we know about the treatment of ERDS today, only a few things. The most important is probably protective lung ventilation. Tardive volume from 6 to 8. Partial pressure below 30. PIP probably high, but I don't know. And nobody knows today. Recruitment maneuver, maybe, but not so sure. Maybe not for all the patient. Probably prone position, at least in France. Outside, I'm not sure. And here are sort of summarized 15 years of research. 50 years, more than 3,000 studies four line. We are sure of that, and that could be discussed. What about the drugs used for ERDS patients? Uh, Paralysis, cisatracurium, we have one old study show that using cisatracurium instead of uh, placebo increased PO2 FO2 ratio. Uh, just precision, cisatracurium is mandatory for anesthesiologists only. Most, most intensive is used is atracurium. Two, two years after, the team of uh, Laurent Papazian showed that this atracurium decreased inflammation in ERDS patients, and they performed a large randomized controlled trial called a crazy study, who showed that in severe ERDS patients below 150 uh, millimeters of mercury of PO2 FiO2 ratio, 42 days of this atracurium decreased mortality of uh, ERDS patient in, in ICU. We don't know exactly why. If it's just um, patient ventilator ablation that is better during the early phase, or if the anti-inflammatory effect of uh, cisatracurium, nobody is able to respond today. What about other drugs? Surfactant, old drug, old studies, uh, at the end of last century, uh, negative study. It don't change anything. We perform a new study in 2004, and it's less than negative because it's adverse. Surfactant hurt the lung, so no more surfactant in the ICU. What about ketoconazole, an anti-inflammatory drug for the lung? Uh, we have been trying two studies, and unfortunately, it's not efficient to decrease mortality of ICU patients. What about lisophilin, an anti-inflammatory drug, especially for the lung? Unfortunately, it's negative, too. We can discuss about almitrin, an old drug, more than 20 studies, and I think today's game with almitrin is over. Definitively, nobody else uses almitrin in ICU. Last month, I tried to find one piece of admitrin in my ICU for a really specific patient and all residents look at me like that, what is this drug? And nobody else, nobody know admitrin today. So it's over. Maybe the nutrition, but the nutrition do not change anything in the course of your day special. Even if we give soft omega-3 fatty acid or something else, no, absolutely no impact on the outcome of our patient. Activated protein C, uh, with a heavy background and, uh, on um, anti-inflammatory drug and on the coagulation, but unfortunately no effect on your ERDS patient, only bleeding in the lung sometimes. So protein C is over. Beta agonist to decrease lung edema. A lot of study in animals, and unfortunately in humans it don't change anything. Maybe it can be half. For if you give beta agonist for all ERDS patients, it's not useful. Maybe some of them, I don't know. We try with statin too, 
but such didn't have absolutely no impact on the course of the RDS. So, what is the problem with the RDS? What is your thought about that? Maybe it's not the good drugs we try, but we try a lot of drugs. Maybe it's not the good patient to seek or to to all or to hypoxemic, I don't know. Or maybe we can imagine that there is different patients with different CRDS who need different drugs. But nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about that. Since few years, we make the hypothesis that maybe other patients are not the same. All patients with the RDS. And my friend Karin Kalfi from UCSF performed a really nice retrospective study on the large cohort of patients included studies of the RDS network. And Caroline have a really smart statistician, and they try to look at the other data with the Bayesian model, really complicated, and they say that, on a statistical point of view, there is two different ERDS patients, two different types of ERDS. They call that subphenotype. And if we look to these two subphenotypes of ERDS, here is one, is two, two different cohort, ANMA and alveoli studies, if we look here, white blood cell or BMI are not able to split the two phenotype. Absolutely not. No difference. If you look to PO2 to FO2 ratio, which is the definition of ERDS, of the severity of ERDS, is not so different between one and one other. But if you look to pro inflammatory markers, there's a huge difference between the two phenotypes. So they conclude that these two phenotypes. One is really pro-inflammatory and the other not so much. They have a really different mortality in the ICU and at day 19. And they have different reaction to PIP setting, for an example. But they look that they have a different uh, outcome according to the fluid administration. So this is not the same patient. We worked since a long time on another type of phenotype, which is lung morphology. And we have the same result that Caroline, just looking to CT scan. So we make the hypothesis that this is something different. The phenotype is what you see. Different in lung morphology or different in pro-inflammatory cytokine. The good question is what is the endotype? And I know it's really hard at the, uh, hard at the end of the day to talk about the endotype. Do you know what is the endotype? The endotype is the mechanism that it could explain the phenotype. Why is there two different phenotypes, focal or non-focal, inflammatory or non-inflammatory? What is the mechanism, the biological pathway that can explain this difference? And with the, my team uh, and Michael Maté, we make the hypothesis that maybe alveolar clearance is the endotype that explains the difference. Most of the patients with the RDS have an alteration of alveolar clearance. That means that the lung is not able to remove the edema, contrary to cardiogenic edema, for an example. So we have a look with a biomarker of uh, epithelial injury called SRAGE. And SRAGE is well correlated with lung morphology. On animal, on human model, we have shown that lung morphology was correlated with alveolar clearance. When you have a diffuse ERDS, you all the patients have a decrease in alveolar clearance. A contrary, when you have focal ERDS, alveolar clearance is quite normal. And we have shown that SRH is absolutely correlated with uh, lung morphology and alveolar clearance. So SRH could be a biomarker of alveolar clearance. The question at this stage is, is it just an association? Probably not, because in animal model, when we try to modulate range expression and when we perform an inhibition of range axis, we decrease lung edema. We decrease the alteration of lung in uh, mice. And this decrease in uh, lung uh, injury is mediated by an increase of the aquaporin 5. So we decrease lung edema via the stimulation of aquaporin when we provide an emission of SRH. I apologize, it's not so simple at the end of the day. So we can say, to summarize, that rage inhibition decreases, uh, increase, sorry, alveolar fluid clearance. 
What about volatile anesthetic? Quickly. We know since a long time that sevoflurane or isoflurane decrease lung inflammation in the RDS model. Volatile anesthetic decrease lung injury in mice, for an example. This decrease in the lung injury is probably related to a decrease in uh, alveolar edema. So it sounds like the same thing that we have shown. And if we move on, we can be quite sure that volatile anesthetic on ERDS model increase aquaporin and decrease lung edema. So probably volatile anesthetic has the same action that rage inhibition and probably volatile anesthetic inhibit rage to decrease lung edema. So all these studies are only on rats. Who have some rats in his ICU? Nobody? Some pigs, maybe? Because the first study was done on pigs? Nobody. Okay. What about in humans? So we have done one study, effectively, as you said, Peter. And we try to, we randomize few patients, 50, on volatile anesthetic or sevoflurane at the early phase of ERDS. And we give volatile anesthetic for two days. The main outcome was the increase in PO2 FO2 ratio, and the secondary outcome was inflammation of the lung. So, so the, to the main outcome, we've shown that when you use sevoflurane, you increase PO2 FO2 ratio, according to placebo or to IV sedation. When you stop isoflurane, PO2 FO2 decrease in one day. This was the first endpoint. But when we look to the biomarker of epithelial injury and the biomarker of alveolar clearance, which is s -rage, we have shown that sevoflurane decreases biomarker of lung edema in the blood and in the alveolus. So probably the increase in PO2-FO2 ratio we saw is due to decrease in lung edema. Why exactly? Why are we sh quite sure that this is a decrease in lung edema? Because if we, it's not in the paper, it's in the letter that is submitted in the Blue Journal, because the decrease in s rage is quite only true in non focal ERDS. So volatile anesthetic decrease lung edema when there is lung edema. If you have no lung edema, if you have just a focal ERDS, lung volatility do not decrease lung edema. But in patients with diffuse ERDS and a really impaired alveolar fluid clearance, sevoflurane increase the clearance and decrease rage. So it's what we could call an action of the sedation. The, on the other hand, it's not only a direct action. Probably volatile anesthetic give a, the best sedation we need for ERDS patients because we need a deep sedation for a short period of time, and probably we decrease delirium too. Why for a short period of time? Because the pharmacokinetic property of sevoflurane in ICU are absolutely the same that we had in OR. When you give sevoflurane to really, really high dose during two days, when you stop the administration of sevoflurane, five minutes after, there's no more sevoflurane in the blood or in the gas experienced by the patient. It's quite amazing compared with propofol or midazolam. Why I think the volatile anesthetic are better for sedation of ICU of ERDS patient? Because it's really predictable. When you have an expiratory fraction of zerothis, but 0 0.6 or above, you are sure that the RAS the score is below minute three. So all patients sleep with uh, 0.6 of tibofluran. And probably it's exactly the same with isoflurane. And it's quite easy to use, even if you are not an anesthesi anesthesiologist. When you want to wake up the patient, when you stop the sedation, uh, most of the time we use after pressure support ventilation. When you put a filter on your patient, you increase respect the work of breathing due to the filter. But if you give volatile anesthetic, in this study it was sevoflurane, you decrease the work of briefing as baseline. So it's probably not the best drug 
to set your patient in pressure support ventilation, but if you want to do that, it's possible for your patient. Is it sevoflurane or is it volatile anesthetic who decrease longer de mer? I'm not sure about the answer. Uh, today, according to animal studies and to mice, uh, we think that only sevoflurane is able to decrease longer de mer. But it's just one study that shows that only sevoflurane in pulmonary ODS is able to decrease inflammation and lung edema. In my lab, we start two or three other studies to confirm or to confirm this data. But today, it's probably sevoflurane that should be used in the ODS, but it's only animal data. What are the perspectives? But to do the same study, but in a large randomized controlled trial, and maybe due to preconditioning or to postconditioning with volatile anesthetic, we are going to try to see what is the impact of volatile anesthetic on healthy lung patients in the ICU. If, it's able, if we can decrease or not the incidence of ALS in our patients. So to summarize, there's really new insight with uh, volatile anesthetic in ICU. It's all drug, all study, but new interest. And in France, to respond to your question, more and more ICU use uh, volatile anesthetic for sedation. Uh, I started in 2003, and during 10 years, we were four teams in France to use volatile anesthetic. In the last two years, more than half of French ICU use volatile anesthetic because there's a growing body of evidence that it could be interesting for our patient. I'm quite sure. To focus on an ERDS patient, I'm sure that volatile anesthetic and probably sevoflurin are have all the property that require ERDS patient. Deep sedation, fourth period of time, free of delirium, and maybe a decrease in lung edema, which is the cornerstone of ERDS patient. Thank for your attention. So, do we have any questions for Jean-Michel? From Toronto. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's, it's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, do you think that the problem which was mentioned by two other speakers, uh, CO2 accumulation will be overcome with new device or new mode of anaconda? Because quite often with ARDS, we use low tidal volumes. Well, it's, it's sure. mandatory, in fact. Yeah? So do you see any conflict in terms yeah. of your potential yeah. recruitment and things like that? You're fully right. Uh, we have this issue of hypercapnia in some patients. I tried the small anaconda in uh, five or six patients, and we move from the big one to the small one in the same patient, and we reduce uh, by 10 to 15 points the capnia of the patient. So I can say that the problem is over. Because in some patients with large dead space, uh, really, really low compliance, maybe it will be difficult even with a small one. But it's only few patients. Is there any difference in the dynamic effect of the inhalatory drug in comparison to the mass sedation that we as intensivists must have in account sure. when using it? Our point of view in my team was that when you start uh, sevoflurane, you dramatically increase norepinephrine, or you start norepinephrine. We were quite sure about that. In the study, 15 patients were normalized, we have no difference in the uh, total amount of norepinephrine. So probably, we feel that sometimes we increase norepinephrine in some patients, but looking to other patients, there's no difference between propofol and midazolam. No really important difference. It's your... Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think a lot of the time when you start with the volatile sedation, you have some other sedation running, and for a period of time, you will have double effect of sedation. Uh, I think if anyone wants to do a study to look at the use of vasopressors, you need to look one hour, two hours down the line at least before you make any, draw any conclusions. Um, do you have uh, any experience with uh, uh, lung transplantation? It uh, is compatible with uh, nitrous oxide? 
Hmm. I have no experience with lung transplantation, with acute lung transplantation. Uh, one of my friends in Marseille, in the south of France, use anaconda and have some lung transplantation in ICU. Uh, honestly, I, I can't answer. I, I can ask him. Uh, maybe you have experience from Toronto? Do you have experience? Yes, we, we have two patients uh, after lung transplantations and unfortunately there was huge fluctuation of nitric oxide. I don't, I don't know for whatever reason, but it didn't go well, but it's just two patients. It is attractive. And uh, yeah. Not so easy, maybe. <laughs> Any further questions? It's time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for your patience with our late <laughs> symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.